For everyone's records, this meeting is being recorded and it is a public meeting. We have a full agenda. Uh, we're going to start this meeting by taking roll call. Rebecca. Good morning. Um, Amy Rourke. Yes, I'm here. Bridget McLeeman. Yeah. David Poland. I'm here. Uh, Councillor Kim Harless. Oh, I just heard my name. <laughs> we are doing roll call. Oh, oh hi. Here. Karen Camera. Here. Uh, Rob Perkins. Here. Uh, Beth Landry. Morning. Here. Janet Snook. Janet is staff Hello. to the board. Uh, Jamie Spinelli. Here. Michael Torres. Good morning, Michael Torres, Clark County Community Services. And except for you, Alicia, I believe that is all the board members present. And staff, the rest are visiting members for the presentations and our interpreters. Thank you, Rebecca. Um, and again, good morning, everyone. Today, we will have a business meeting to start off, and then we will have guests from a community service organizations who have applied for funds. They'll be providing a presentation to board members. There will be an opportunity for an open forum at the end of our business meeting before we head into presentations. Due to the state of emergency and the governor's proclamation, this meeting is only being offered virtually. We will ask po participants not to use the chat feature if possible. If there are questions, please use verbal responses. Since this is a public meeting, those on the phone would not have access to the chat feature and having phone access to the meeting is a requirement of the governor's proclamation. So with that, we do have two items for Approval, we have two sets of minutes from our January meetings. I would entertain a motion on the January 4th, 2020 minutes. Feel free board members to unmute yourself. This is Karen Kamaroff. I move that we approve the meeting minutes for January. It's Amy Rourke, I second that. Thank you. We have a motion and a second. All those in favor, please use voice. Say aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Okay, the minutes are approved. The second set of minutes for consideration is January 7th. Is there a motion? I move adoption of the, this is Rob Perkins. I move adoption of the January 7th meeting minutes. Thank you, Rob. Is there a second? Second that Amy Rourke does. Thank you, Amy. Okay, we have a motion and a second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Okay, the second set of minutes are approved unanimously. Okay, thank you so much. With that, we're gonna move into our July through December 2021 outcomes report. And uh, we'll hand the floor over to Rebecca. Good morning, and I apologize. I was not prepared, so I'm gonna open up that report really quick. Maybe not as quick as I was hoping I would be this morning. See where it's going. I have a new laptop and now it's there. There we go. I apologize for that. Okay, so here is the second quarter report for the fiscal year 
Uh, these are uh, this data is from July 1st, 2021 through December 31st, 2021. Um, when we look at the participant satisfaction from the um, programs and what they've submitted with their quarterly reports, we had 1,944 surveys sent to individuals and we received 588 responses for just over 30% response rate and an 87.4% positive overall experience. As a reminder, we ask the agencies, uh, they are, they customize their participation or their satisfaction surveys to fit the type of program that they are providing. Um, and then we ask them to have at least one question that gives an overall satisfaction. We report on anything that is positive, anything that is neutral or negative is not included in this 87% number. So this is a positive response to the program participation. This uh, page is just an overview of all of the things that are being funded currently uh, with the programs, the community action programs and the homeless crisis response system programs. As mentioned in the last meeting, uh, this has been updated for a, a couple of new programs that have opened since um, the uh, last request for application was done, um, and that is the Catholic Charities Bertha's Place, Bertha's Place 2 is also included in there, um, and Elahan Place is all wrapped in the Bertha's Place reporting as one report from that agency. Looking at expenditures, um, we would be expecting the agencies from the community action programs to be around 50% spent halfway through the program. As we've noted before, a couple of our programs do spend out more quickly uh, with the uh, grant dollars that we provide before they use their foundation dollars. Um, so, for example, Share Hunger Response, you can see they're nearly spent out for their program. That is typical. We do not fund the entire program. The rest of the agencies are pretty close to the 50% um, spend out time uh, amounts. Um, Clark College is noted as having other pandemic related dollars that they were using for emergency grants. Um, as of this month or of January, I'm sorry, they are now back to spending out these, uh, these grant dollars. So you'll see that quickly increase um, and they will be on track um, with the next quarterly report. For the homeless crisis response system, oops, I'm sorry, programs, um, again, 50% is approximately where they should be. The Bertha's Place is um, opened late uh, at the end of the six months, so there's very little spending shown here. That will pick up with the next report. Um, and then the outreach programs are, are now up and running. So uh, the coordinated outreach program you'll see is very low in their spending, but they will um, pick that up. Um, now that that program is uh, open. When we look at the community action system performance measures, uh, their total people served, um, we can see that some of the programs are doing significantly well. And we expected that with the pandemic. These are uh, types of programs that are being um, accessed at significantly higher rates. Um, for example, um, under support services, we have 2 on one info, so people are, you know, uh, significantly more people are reaching out to, for information and referral to resources in the community. Um, and then, um, as I'm sure many of you have seen in the newspaper, the uh, Clark County Food Bank has seen a significant increase, and they're reporting under the health and social behavioral health category, um, and therefore, uh, we see significantly higher numbers for those programs. Partners in Careers is struggling to engage some um, program participants um, with the new model in the first you know, few months of this fiscal year, but they've been working on some new efforts. Um, and so we should be seeing those numbers pick up before the end of the, the fiscal year. And, oops, sorry, let's keep going too fast. The um, other community action service outcomes that I just wanted to kind of show and highlight. Um, so with the uh, Food Bank's Fresh Alliance program, which is where they pick up groceries from stores that would otherwise be discarded. Um, they have received over 817,000 pounds of food in that six months, which is the equivalent of just over five space shuttles. The Volunteer Lawyers program has helped 670 households avoid evictions. That is three times the number of all of last year. 
we do realize that there was a, an eviction moratorium in place for a majority of that time, um, but they were still households that, um, that were able to be evicted um, for reasons other than being behind on rent. So they did help quite a few households that last year. Now that the eviction moratorium has ended, we um, can set, definitely see an uptick in the services that they're providing for housing services there. SHARE's hunger response program provided um, over 45,000 meals at SHARE House. And the Housing Solutions Center as our main coordinated entry uh, for our housing programs, including the additional eviction rent assistance dollars that we've received, assessed over 8,000 households in that six months for housing placements. And they were also able to divert over 200 households from the homeless crisis response system uh, through some funding that they have, which is fantastic. So they're not even having to enter into the housing programs. As a reminder for homeless crisis response system performance measurements, the best place to go is Council for the Homeless and their system dashboards. That's where you're going to find a lot of information on each individual housing program and different types of information, such as returns to homelessness, um, the length of home, the length of homelessness, how long it takes them to get into housing, things like that. So we always recommend going in and checking that out on a regular basis. We're just looking at a couple of different um, key measurements that are noted across all of the programs. So uh, the total people served, we would expect them to be around 50% of their contract goal. Um, and you can see that they're getting around their PSH uh, programs are typically households that are going to be in services for many years. So they report all of them in the very beginning, the first quarter of the fiscal year, and then they only um, report new households that come into the program for the rest of the fiscal year. So we always know that we're gonna see around 100% um, in the beginning. It's hard to predict if households are going to be able to graduate out of PSH, which is why sometimes we do see over 100% of what they, their goal is. Um, our, we are always looking to make sure that they are between 80 and 120% of their contracted goals as a good targeting measure. Um, rapid rehousing has also seen quite a few um, new households. Many of these also received services, uh, their ongoing services from the previous fiscal year. So they'll be reported in that first quarter. So we'll see higher numbers there. The uh, programs have also received additional funding COVID dollars that have helped support um, rapid housing households. Um, a couple of things to note is just that the Housing Solutions Center um, seen that dramatic increase for requests of, uh, for assistance. Um, and then the Housing and Essential Needs Rapid Rehousing Program anticipates that most of the households will remain in that program for the year due to the income and disability status um, upon entry. So we anticipate in the Rapid Rehousing category because of the HEN program that there will be C higher numbers. And then to the other question that we ask uh, across all of our programs is uh, regarding maintaining and increasing income. That is a goal so that households can meet stability. And so you can see the uh, numbers that are um, here for the uh, homeless crisis response system programs. Um, and so we would like to see these closer to 50%. Some are doing really well. Permanent supportive housing, typically because they're on disability, can maintain that. And so we would uh, anticipate to see that 100% or very close to that 100% mark for those households. Rapid rehousing. The, for program value is to provide um, the assistance quickly to get them stable as fast as possible. So how um, income is one of those high uh, re uh, requests that the households work on so that they can get that stability faster. And then the last um, section is our demographics. So this is taking a look at all the community action and homeless crisis response system programs out of HMIS. Not all programs enter information into HMIS and they do um, report separately and that is included in these numbers. Um, and then not every person answers every question. So we've included how many responses for each question are there and that's why you see different numbers for each of the de uh, different demographics. And these are some of the main things, uh, demographics that we get pretty consistently from most of our um, program participants. At the bottom is other characteristics. We document how many uh, households were chronically homeless um, at entrance into the program, 
um, if they served in the military or if they have a disability. And these are self-identified um, characteristics that we collect. Any questions about the second quarter report? Any questions from members of the board? Okay, hearing none. Thank you, Rebecca. So we have several guests with us this morning, board, and as you know, we are responsible for scoring applications. And so this is a part of the process to get to know uh, what we are reading and, and having an opportunity to ask questions uh, before we move into the formal award of funds. So with that, I know we're a little ahead of schedule, so I hope everyone is here. Um, we'll have Impact Northwest be our first presenter. Um, are, is Impact Northwest here? Yes, we are. Wonderful. Feel free to unmute yourself and, and come on to camera if you have one. Rebecca has a handy little timer. I'll let her go over exactly what the process will be. But as you can see on the presentation guideline, applicants have five minutes to present and then we will have five minutes for questions. Great, so you wanna introduce yourself and then I'll give you the floor and we'll start the timer. All right, and then uh, Rebecca, you're gonna be doing the slides then? I'll just say next slide. Okay, perfect. Uh, hi, I'm RJ Stanglin. I'm the Assistant Director at Impact Northwest in our Housing and Safety Net Services. Uh, and today, or this great rainy Wednesday morning, we're gonna be talking about our Homes for Good Permit Supportive Housing Program. Uh, next slide, please. To begin, uh, let's talk about the experience. Impact Northwest was invited a little over seven years ago to apply for a HUD uh, funded grant to provide permanent supportive housing in Clark County. Uh, over the many years, uh, we've expanded that program to also get local funds to help those that may not meet HUD's el eligibility for permanent supportive housing, but are also more vulnerable and need the uh, assistance. As you can see, over the seven years, we've served uh, 18 households in HUD, and then 21, which includes those 18, have also been uh, served through local funds, and 100% of them remain housed today. We also have experience doing a similar program in Clackamas County called Shelter Plus Care. Uh, and you can see that uh, we serve 32 households annually, and we have a 92.3% uh, housing retention rate. Next slide, please. Uh, so let's talk about our fundamentals. Uh, first and foremost, when we meet a referral, we do intervention. We have mobile intake, so we can meet people where they're at. We'll do safety planning if that's needed. We'll expedite uh, crisis response. We have creative partnerships. Uh, we always engage with our landlords because they're one of our best partners to ensure housing. Uh, we'll even do mediation as needed. And then we have uh, flexible funds uh, to do emergency basic need. Next slide. So our service model, uh, as you know, Impact Northwest is a housing first uh, agency. We're also a trauma-informed care agency where we focus on harm reduction and strength-based person-centered uh, service planning. Uh, this assists uh, clients in identifying strengths and challenges. It leverages the strengths to overcome the challenges. And then we offer resource information referral if we can't do it in-house. Uh, Client-centered action planning can include tenant education, life skill development, and community involvement. Next slide, please. So partnerships, uh, as you can see, we've grown our partnerships over the many years doing this program. Uh, Council for the Homeless is the first and foremost because they're coordinated access and, and uh, assesses those that are referred into these programs. We also have a partnership with Partners in Careers where they offer us office space as well as their employment resources. Uh, we recently partnered with the National Alliance of Mental uh, Illness of Southwest Washington because we know that mental health is one of the more crucial underserved parts of the PSH program. And they really can bring that crisis intervention where we aren't the experts. Uh, the PSH local funds help us implement the HUD urban development funding that I previously talked about, which brings over $200,000 uh, to Clark County on an annual basis. We also have a lawyer partnership with Clark County Volunteer Lawyers to remove legal barriers and help with uh, eviction mediation. Partnerships with landlords, key properties in the group being the main ones for this program, YWCA for emergency DV services. And then we have partnerships with Providence and Kaiser where they can help our clients uh, 
obtain healthcare navigation, benefit registration, and info and referral. Next slide, please. So I just saw we have uh, one typo. So the outputs in our proposal is actually 15 households served. Currently, we have up to 13 right now. Uh, the target population are the most vulnerable, being chronically homeless, long-term disability survivors of DV, IPV, and SA, underserved homeless veterans, persons in any stage of addiction or recovery, and disproportionately impacted households identified in the equity report. Next slide, please. So our outcomes, uh, we are confident that we can have 100% of our households maintain and or increase income. 100% will be referred to mainstream resources and services. 100% of households remain stable in housing for at least one year. 95% will uh, exit to permanent housing and 80% will engage with health and wellness services. We also have a SOAR trained uh, case manager who can help expedite uh, SOAR applications to receive SSDI benefits. Next slide. All right, 30 seconds for a success story. So we have a, a client named Joe, a single dad, chronic health conditions, three kids. Uh, he was referred uh, to PSH local because he didn't fit HUD standard to be eligible for that program. Uh, he was in and out of shelter system and living in the car with his three young kids. Uh, we persevered, uh, took a little, about a year to overcome the legal barriers, the housing debt, and now he's housed with three kids and he's very grateful that we did not give up on him. Questions and answer time, boom. Very well done, RJ. <laughs> I feel like the micro uh, machine guy. Yeah, that was very, very good. Okay, this is an opportunity for board members. If you have questions, we have five minutes. Go ahead, David. Perfect. Oh, Rob, David, and then we'll have Rob. Go ahead, David. Okay, can you hear my voice okay? Um, my question is very simple. You did a lot of acronyms. A lot of them I know, like DV is domestic violence. What is SA and IPV? Because I know it's not IPA like loggers, so. Uh, interpersonal violence and sexual assault. Okay, thank you so for clearing that. Sorry about the acronyms. Uh, it's It's a fast way to talk. Yeah, and I know you had limited time, but also not only for me, but if, if the public is watching, I want them to know what you're talking about. And DV is domestic violence in case people don't know. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, David. Go ahead, Rob. Those were my questions. Oh, fabulous. <laughs> I could add, uh, is the slide deck available to us? RJ, are you willing to share your slides with the board? Oh, uh, yeah, and except for the one typo where I put 13 when it should actually be 15 for our proposal. I can correct that and the recording and the slides will be provided within the next day or so to the board. Thank you, Rebecca. Thank you. Any other questions for Impact Northwest? Hearing none, I want to say thank you so much for providing the PowerPoint. It makes it a lot easier to follow along. And thank you for like Bridget time. might have her hand raised, Alicia. Oh, yes, thank you so much. I see Beth, do you have a question? I'll go after Bridget though. Okay, Bridget, hi. Bridget, do you have your hand up? Uh, if you are trying to speak, you're on mute. Okay, I'm not hearing anything from Bridget. Go ahead, Beth. Okay, um, RJ, I was just hoping that you could also um, talk, and I'm, I'm probably going to be asking most most of our presenters today these kind of same questions, but just so uh, we have some uh, additional context for the board and, and their scoring process. Can you talk a little bit about um, the staff to client ratios and how staff are prepared to do this type of work and what that looks like for your agency? Uh, thank you, Beth. Uh, that, that's a great question. Uh, typically, Impact Northwest uh, has a, a one FTE 40 hours a week uh, to client ratio of one to 20. But we know that permanent support of housing uh, can be a lot more challenging. So we're really advocating to have a one to 10 because when crisis happens uh, or trying to overcome the housing barriers, it takes a lot more energy uh, to ensure when those crises do happen that we're mediating and we're intervening appropriately so that housing can still remain successful. 
Thank you. Okay, and it sounds like Bridget is having mic issues, so she may log out and try to log back in. Um, David, you still have your hand up. Did you have any other questions? Yes, I have one more. Um, I'm just curious about, can you, can you tell me about the average amount of time it takes for a person who gets entry or meets with your people and then is successfully get housed? So in PSH, it can vary. Our HUD program is a master leasing program where Impact Northwest is actually the tenant. And then we have an agreement with the property uh, manager or owner that we can sublet to our client. In those, it, it takes a little less because they already know that we're going to be very responsive and ensure housing stability. In our PSH local funded, we use the private market and the tenant themselves are the only leaseholder. So sometimes that can increase the time to overcome housing barriers so that the property manager or owner uh, will feel that it's not as risky taking on a tenant that maybe on the application looks um, risky. But um, so typically our goal is to house someone within 60 days uh, from referral. In our master lease program, we've had it done before 30 days. But also on the flip side, the, the one gentleman success story, it took almost over a year with the legal challenges and the, the property debt. Yeah, that's what I was curious if it was typical for one year. So that's a long time. Thank you. Well, the reason I, so one thing that I love about working at Impact is we really won't uh, turn someone away as long as our funder is willing to still encourage. And I've been very grateful, or we've been very grateful that Clark uh, still allows us to work with someone that may take a year to get housed. Because really, when people can get into housing, especially in PSH, it's a long term success. Okay, thank you, David. Uh, Beth, you still have your hand up. Did you have another comment? I do. Thanks, Alicia. Um, I so I just wanted to add two things um, just for information. So we our system goal for PSH from um, time from program entry, so the time that an intake is completed with a service agency to time housed is 90 days or less. So that's the standard, the system goal just for PSH as an intervention. Um, and then agencies that are struggling to meet that have a goal of decreasing that time by 10 days annually. So if someone was at 100 days, then the next year goal would be 90 days. Um, and I also wanted to add, I see a note from Bridget, and it looks like her question was around the 95% exit to permanent housing when it looked like there wasn't much turnover in the program. Um, and maybe RJ, that might be worth clarifying, um, and you're welcome to do this, that the percent exit also means percent retention. If do you want to add any notes there? Uh, yeah, thank you to clarify. Yeah, the 95 is retention, but also uh, as much as I, I want to say it will be 100%, uh, I just know sometimes it doesn't work or the, the great thing is sometimes people do graduate because either they don't need the support of service anymore and they are now vouchered where their rent is now based on their income and then we can take on a new referral. So as much as I wanted to put 100%, I, I didn't want to overcommit or overpromise. Okay, thank you. All right, hearing no additional questions and not seeing any hands raised. Uh, thank you so much, RJ. We appreciate you taking the time this morning. We'll go ahead and welcome uh, Cher, who will be talking about the Permanent Supportive Housing Program. Good morning. I apologize, I do not have a slide. I'm, I'm now learned that uh, that is extremely helpful when presenting. So lesson learned, and uh, that was really nice to learn um, from RJ about what a wonderful slide would look like. So um, I'm Katie Lewis. I've been working with Cher for about eight years. Uh, the majority of my time has been spent working in um, shelters, so emergency shelter services. Uh, in the last year, I transitioned over to the um, affordable housing and stability team. And what I do over here is I support a large uh, group of wonderful housing navigators and case managers that support either rapid rehousing clients or permanent supportive housing clients. Um, the presentation that I'm giving you right now is around uh, the ask for match dollars. That was really inconvenient. Um, so we 
on top of having, we have multiple funding sources. Um, one of those funding sources is through HUD. Um, we have about five different funding sources through them. Some of it is for um, rental assistance. So it would be the client in the community uh, signing their own lease and us providing rental services, case management and housing navigation services to them. Um, the other portion is what we call leasing, where we master lease a unit and assist a client uh, into um, you know, stabilizing in that space and continuing the supports around them. Um, so what we're asking for is when we when we get those access to be able to apply for these and get these HUD um, these HUD grants, we also have to put up a certain percentage of match. And it looks like 25% of the grant funds, except for leasing funds. So all of the case management and client services dollars must be matched um, at 25%. So that's what this ask is for. Um, we, the, the clients that we serve, um, we are part of the coordinated entry program. So we get all of our referrals from Council for the Homeless and all of these clients for these PSH HUD dollars um, and programs are some of the most vulnerable in our community. So they've had a vulnerability assessment done on them um, and they are the highest scores and they come to us and we um, support them through the housing navigation, uh, identifying housing barriers, eliminating housing barriers, and then um, help them transition and stabilize into their housing. Um, what this, what these dollars could do for us, if we were not, if we didn't have to provide this money out of our pockets or out of our other funding sources, it can help us do things like um, eliminate some of those housing barriers. So as you heard, you know, a lot of our clients come with a lot of maybe a uh, property debt. They come with, uh, you know, maybe some criminal history where they owe fines and fees. They've got, you know, old bills and those sorts of things that keep them out of housing. So if we can focus, you know, our dollars on eliminating those barriers, we could do the things like reducing the amount of time that people spend houseless after intake, um, you know, getting us to that 30 to 90 days. Um, it can help us help them stabilize in housing. I mean, their first three to six months to a year is, is some of the most important times and having funds to be able to purchase couches, um, just those essential needs that the, the HUD dollars don't cover, um, but, you know, are still really, really important um, for people to have to be able to stabilize uh, in, their, in their home and start building roots in their community and really being successful. Um, in actualizing uh, their their goals. Um, so we serve about 60 clients with these PSH dollars um, across the board. Um, we, so we also have, um, I know that people had asked before about kind of what our staffing looks like. Um, because of the vulnerability of our clients, we actually uh, have a staffing of one to 15. Um, so that we can really truly support people um, and and have the capacity to support people that are in crisis um, and then fluctuate through. Uh, sometimes, you know, we only need to meet with them, you know, four times a month and sometimes it's four times a week. Um, but really being able to meet people where they're at and, you know, provide that support that they need and, and collaborate with others to help them stabilize. Um, we we choose to do a one to, to 15 ratio for client staffing. Um, one success story is that we have been able to collaborate with the VHA to do emergency Vancouver Housing Authority um, on some emergency housing vouchers. And we've been able to transition um, a couple people off of our program onto, um, onto just rental assistance, right? They were able to stabilize and actualize and now they just need the rental assistance and don't need that case management support. So that was really exciting to be able to do in this last year. Thank you, Katie. So I have a quick clarifying question before we open up the floor to the board. You have uh, two applications under yes. yeah. PSH. So we were providing you two separate 10, 10 minute segments. The first was just on the PSH. The second was going to be on the PSH HUD match support. In your presentation that you just provided us, it sounded like you were kind of intermixing or commingling the two applications. Is that correct? Actually, no, I'm sorry. I actually misread this. So this one is for the HUD match. So the, you're right, there's two separate. 
So we're asking for the HUD match, which is that 25% match to be able to support our HUD, our HUD clients, our HUD PSH clients. The second PSH presentation will be specifically for the PSH County funding source that we have, which is different. It okay, supports so a different just, group of people, same, same population, just a different group of people, different funding okay. source. So for board members, for clarification, the presentation we're asking questions on is the one that was slated for 940. So this is the PSH HUD match support, and then we'll transition to the next application after our question period here. So thank you for that clarification, Katie and um, board members. Feel, feel free to raise your hand. Amy, so hey, on our ahead, thing Amy. here, it would be the one she just did uh, would be um, the first one on the share INC, and then the other one says alternate one. That's the second one, right? I apologize for the confusion, you guys. My nerves so this, got me, and I just jumped right into HUD match. <laughs> that's okay, Katie. No worries. Okay, I think this is the request for 138000 On the agenda, it's in the red section at the bottom of the red section so does that does that answer your question amy yeah it does thank you yeah and hot match can be kind of confusing um you know it's we we get we're able to apply for and get you know hud funding for our pacific the specific psh programs that we get and we have five of those um it's just that we have to um for the rental assistance programs we have to come up with tw match dollars to be able to match it. And it can come from, from anywhere. It just can't come from other con um, continuum of care dollars. So it can't be federal HUD funded dollars. So we just have to match 25%. And I guess just to reiterate, the reason why we are asking you guys to assist us with that is because we can then use dollars that we have um, to be able to focus on providing more client support services and also more case management housing navigation services. Did that answer your question, Amy? Yes, yes, yes it did. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions from members of the board? Bridget? Question. Sorry. Oh, who was that? Jamie? It is, but Bridget can go ahead. Okay, we'll have Bridget and then Jamie and then David. Do you have audio, Bridget? I'm not hearing anything, unfortunately. Go ahead and type it in the chat, although we're trying not to use it, Bridget, and I'll go ahead and read your question for you. Um, while you type, we'll go ahead and move on to, to Jamie. Thank you for the presentation. Um, is this, I just wanna make sure I understand, is this to support existing PSH clients or new PSH clients? Jamie, that's a really good question. It's, it's to support existing um, clients, but what's exciting is that we've really been focusing on um, the national movement called Move On. Um, HUD's really pushing this forward. And really what it is is like embracing that housing first um, philosophy and idea that if you get people housed and you support them through that stabilization, they're then able to actualize, realize and actualize, and then, you know, really move off the program eventually. You know? No, um, that would be the goal. And then that opens up space for more people to come in. Um, but also what we found is that, you know, it's nice and all, it's all well and good to move somebody into housing, but if you don't have additional dollars and supports to help them maintain and like sustain that housing, then they become one of the people that fall off. Um, and we don't want that to happen. We want them to stabilize. So what we, what we hope to do through really focusing on um, you know, evidence-based practices and really supporting people where they are is that they will be able to actualize, move off, and then make room for more people to come on. So right now, Jamie, we are supporting um, on for the HUD match program specifically, 30 people, 30 PSH, and then we have five referrals and housing people housing search right now. 
So um, we're always looking at the money and how we can support more people um, while also still focusing on outcomes too. I mean, we wanna make sure that our outcomes um, and that there's a return on the investment and the people are, are being supported in the way that they need to be supported. So that's a really good question. A quick follow-up. So if you, if you did not receive all this money, would you then not be able to support people who are currently in housing? Um, it would be more challenging to support people. If we got this money, we would we would be able to support people better and also be able to um, maybe take on additional people um, because we have the case management support to be able to do that. That's kind of a struggle too, right? It's like, if we don't have the, the dollars to be able to help support the case managers and do that client support, then we can't actually take on more people, even if we had the leasing funds. So that's where we kind of fall short a lot, is that funding for that client support services and the case management. So I believe that with this money, we'd be able to support more people. Okay, thank you so much. I have uh, two more questions here. I'm gonna read Bridget's and then David, and then we're gonna need to wrap up to move on to your second presentation. So the question from Bridget, is there a specific program supporting 60 clients? Do the referrals come through Council for the Homeless or through HUD? So Great the question. question All yeah, if, if there are five different programs, is this a specific program supporting 60 clients? Yes. So, well, so what, what I just explained to Jamie is in totality, all of our HUD programs, that's the mix of the, the master leasing, the leasing and the rental assistance supports a total of about 60. Um, the, the programs that we're asking that need us to match 25% are our rental assistance and we support 30 and then we have five additional referrals right now that are searching. So 35 clients right now. Um, and then she had a second part of that question. Do the referrals come through Council for the Homeless or through HUD? Great question. Our agreement share across the board is all of our referrals come through coordinated entry, which is Council for the Homeless. Um, they do the, the initial intakes. Um, we have outreach teams and also their teams that do vulnerability assessments on our clients um, and then send us the referrals. Okay, thank you. Okay, David, and then we're gonna move to the second presentation. Okay, I'll try to make this brief and maybe you can answer the brief, um, but I'm just curious about um, what it looks like uh, that you'd be providing. For example, you said something about a sofa. It might be an example of a way of stability so that people's lives would um, be more integrated in the community. Uh, is, is that uh, really what it looks like? Or can, maybe you can give me an example. Yeah, um, I know I can be long-winded. I get super excited about this stuff. Um, so yes, so it can look like stabilization in a home can look like lots of different things, right? Um, this particular funding does not support um, purchasing household items or goods. I mean, if you could imagine somebody that's been living on the street for, you know, anywhere from five to two weeks, uh, trying to being like, here you go. Uh, there's really nothing here, but uh, go ahead and stabilize. Um, that doesn't really support them in staying in that space. So yes, um, you know, it's, it's crisis planning that first night that they're there. Um, it's ensuring that they have um, a certain level of comfort um, and feel safe and supported in that space. And sometimes that takes a couple of weeks for them to feel that way. Um, but having those things that we think are comfort items, but really are, you you need to have a place to sit, right? If you're gonna feel, feel comfortable in your home. Um, you need to have dishes to be able to eat off of and you know utensils to be able to cook with. You need to have a shower curtain. So those things seem like, you know, just things, but they're they're super important in helping somebody stabilize in that space. You know, and then you also have the all the other things, right? You gotta you wanna connect them with resources in their community. You want to um, help them find resources in their community. You want to bring lots of other people and I will stop there. Thank you, Katie, very much. Did that answer your question? I see David saying thank you. Okay, uh, Rebecca, please yes, set up the timer. You. So just as a reminder, Katie, you have a timer on your screen for five minutes for the presentation and then we'll have follow-up questions. So um, feel so, free to take it away. Yes, thank you. Um, so I answered a lot of uh, 
questions in the last round. So I'm just going to focus on some of the things that um, that I've been able to that were good, I felt have been important in kind of moving our PSH programs along. Um, the county, uh, the funding source that I'm talking to you about right now is um, a county permanent supportive housing funding. We get our referrals through the same the same way. We get them through the Council for the Homeless. They're, they too are some of the most vulnerable in the community. Um, we also have a staff client ratio of one to 15 for this program as well. I think the county standard is one to 20. Um, we are serving right now, we currently have 16 clients on the program, two pending um, or that are housing searching. We also have housing navigators that work with these clients um, in tandem with the case manager uh, to build a relationship, do housing search and supports, and then transition into um, their their home. Um, I think some of the things that we've been able to do in the last year that are super exciting is we really have focused a lot on our training for our staff. Um, we really, really, really um, want to make sure that if we're supporting the most vulnerable clients in the community, we have the tools and skills and abilities to do that. So we've really uh, refocused. We do a lot of uh, training with org code, which I know the county knows about, um, since they've also provided some trainings through them. Um, we do a lot of training through supportive housing um, learning center, uh, which is all about permanent supportive housing in the community. Um, and really, really spent time putting structure to our training um, so that we can redu reduce turnover and really, really have our case managers know how to support uh, the most vulnerable people in our community um, to help increase them in stabilizing and retaining um, their housing. Um, we went from you know 25 to 30 caseload down to the 15, which is really exciting. Um, we also transitioned from doing um, a lot of work in office <laughs> To doing it in the community. So we've refocused and we expect our, our staff to be in the community, working with people in their spaces, in their homes, um, to ensure that their, their living space is healthy, that they have a good relationship with their neighbors and their landlords, which all leads to retention. Um, they're out in the community 75% of the time and have reduced you know, some of that in-office stuff down to 25%, uh, which is just incredible. Um, we are always, we've really focused on diversifying our staff um, and then also looking for ways to prioritize our BIPOC community because they are uh, traditionally underserved. Um, and our DEI uh, report that was released shows that. So we're actively looking for ways to be able to do that. Um, we also worked with, uh, we do a lot of collaborating uh, with community members. So a lot of our clients, um, we do round tables once a month or as often as we need to, uh, to be able to help them uh, retain services with like community, with behavioral health providers, um, also with in-home care providers um, and, you know, other, other people in the community that uh, to be able to help them build a support network that's not just us, because um, the intention is that, you know, hopefully they won't need us forever um, if they've been able to, you know, stabilize in their housing. So really helping them um, find other supports in the community, um, but always being there along their journey to support and cheerlead them on. Um, we also were able to, with some of these clients, um, we were able to transition seven this last year since July 1st last year, seven households off of this funding source um, onto an emergency housing voucher. So again, opening up seven more spots for you know highly coveted PSH spots in our community. Um, so that's really, really exciting and huge success for us on this end. Um, anybody have any more questions about that? Yeah, we'll open up the floor to questions. Thank you for staying within your 5 minute timeline. Uh, looks like Jamie has a question. Thanks, Katie. Um, so the, the folks who transitioned from PSH to the emergency vouchers, does that mean that those individuals no longer receive. Uh, 
like supportive services from you guys? They're just on the voucher now. Jamie, that is a really good question. So yes and no. So we've, with, especially with our PSH clients, we've built a really like long-term relationship with them. And sometimes people love to like still reach out when they need help. And we are always here for that. Um, I know that we actually are still supporting some of those clients. Um, it's looking more, more of like maybe once a month, um, but they, for the most part, are utilizing services otherwise that we've already set up and had in place. And for us to look at the people um, that we had that we wanted to transition off were people that had been long-term um, and all but one right now is doing really, really well. I'm just gonna be honest. Yeah. I actually yeah. had just one follow-up um, and it was, my mind's gone blank. Oh, is this one of the programs that people are able to transition from um, rapid rehousing to permanent supportive housing should the need arise? Yes, Jamie, thank you. And I know that the county, we're, I, I, we're kind of working on coming up with a process for being able to identify people that are in rapid rehousing that need, that we know they need that additional support. Um, this would be one of those programs that would be able to do that. So that's really exciting. And what's really important about that HUD has some additional um, restrictions around that sort of thing and requirements. Um, and so that's why this PSH program is so Im imperative for our community, because we do, I know I'm preaching to some of you are the choir, um, we do have that need where we are serving really high highly vulnerable people in our rapid rehousing programs um, that need to transition to PSH. And if there's not an avenue to do that, then we are, we're in a world of hurt. So this is one of those programs that can do that. Jamie, thank you so much for pointing that out. Okay, Katie, we have two questions in only two minutes. So try to be concise in the it. answers. Okay, go ahead, Bridget first and then Amy. Doesn't look like Bridget has audio. Go ahead and type your question, Bridget, and I'll have Amy ask her question. Do you still have a question, Amy? Yeah, it was kind of off what Jamie had said. Um, I'm just wondering, like, I know personal experience that, you know, um, things are going good, da, 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 da. This is actually for the um, permanent housing one, I guess. But um, is so afterwards, say six months down the road that they have an issue, are they able to go back? Is there support for them able to go back? And is there a certain time limit that they can't, you know, be able to get help? support you know because things go good and everything's fine and they forget about it and then all of a sudden boom something happens and it's you know couldn't wind them up almost once i absolutely agree with you we do not have a time limit we are not here to just not serve people and cut them off um again those relationships that we built are important to us and we want to always i mean obviously we want to reduce recidivism right and if it takes us intervening some of our time to be able to help somebody, you know, retain their housing. We're going to do that. End of story. Thank you, Katie. Um, Bridget asks, do you happen to know your housing retention rate? That is a really good question off the top of my head. I'm looking at our PSH. I kind of defer to the Council for the Homeless uh, dashboard system. And it looks like right now we're at a hundred, we have a hundred percent permanent or positive access, which is also a hundred percent retention. Okay. From the, for this, for November through January. And I'm looking at. Uh, okay. Follow up question. This is the last question. Then we're going to move on to our next presentation. Um, Bridget's follow up question. She says, you mentioned 16 searching. How many do we currently serve in this stream of funding? We have 16 that are currently housed and that we are serving and we have two that are searching, sorry. Okay, thank you for that clarification. Okay, Katie, thank you so much for joining us this morning and presenting your two applications. We will go ahead and close the question period for CAB board members and we would like to welcome up Impact Northwest. This is under the rapid rehousing program category, and this request is in the amount of $293,323. Um, I'll go ahead and give that form of introduction for each of the um, items that we're going to be seeing here board. Sorry, I didn't do that for the first two. 
So with that, um, who who do we have as a presenter? It's RJ again. Welcome back, RJ. The floor All right. Is yours. Thank you for uh, your time again. All right, so uh, we're we're requesting uh, funding to continue our rapid rehousing programs in Clark County. Next slide, please. To begin, our experience uh, is based on us starting uh, rapid rehousing a little over, I believe, six years ago in fiscal year 16. Uh, we had priorities or prioritized populations of families, veterans, chronically homeless, and domestic violence survivors. As you can see, we've served five pro programs uh, over the years, 78 households uh, in total throughout uh, our four county area, 28 of them being in Clark County. We also have rapid rehousing experience implementing the supportive services for veteran families, which is uh, veteran specific. Uh, as you can see, we've served 464 households uh, throughout the four counties, as well as 105 being in Clark County themselves. Uh, the reason I added permanent supportive housing in the three programs I spoke about earlier is because a lot of the same skills and experience needed to uh, house a very vulnerable uh, PSH referral uh, easily uh, translates into rapid rehousing uh, skill sets. Uh, next slide, please. So the program fundamentals also mirror what we do in PSH. We have crisis intervention where we can do same day referral response. We can expedite intakes uh, so that we can get them eligible and access resources uh, to uh, remove housing barriers and ideally uh, house them within our goal is 60 days uh, or less. Uh, the service model is exactly the same as PSH uh, with just a little bit different towards the end in rapid rehousing. The goal is to get them up and stable so that they can graduate and then their income yeah. and ability to maintain housing uh, can be provided without this program. But we also want to offer some aftercare and follow up. So we will provide check ins on a three, six and 12 month basis uh, just to see how things are going. And then if they need any kind of information or resources, we can make those uh, or offer those uh, to them. Next slide, please. So our partnerships also are very similar to our P PSH. Uh, if we build a partnership uh, for any of our clients, it really translates into either or because everyone can benefit uh, working with uh, Council for the Homeless as the coordinated access or entry point, uh, the employment resources that Partner in Careers brings, uh, same with the mental health resources that NAMI of Southwest Washington. Uh, Clark County volunteer lawyers are amazing. Uh, they, they have definitely helped our rapid rehousing clients uh, remove barriers or and sometimes write letters on behalf to ward off an eviction uh, after we've housed them. Uh, YWCA as the dedicated domestic violence service provider, our medical partnerships with Providence and Kaiser, and as always our private landlords and property managers are crucial. Uh, when they know that impact will be responsive and we've built that relationship, it's a lot more easy to have them reach out to us and say, hey, we have an opening and who can you fill or bring to it to the table? So that really helps us uh, expedite those rapid rehousing clients. Next slide. So our outputs and outcomes, uh, we're proposing to serve 15 literally homeless households a year. Uh, we have similar uh, outcomes of 100% maintainer increased income, uh, they'll be re uh, all of them will be referred to mainstream resources. 90% will exit to permanent housing. 80% will gain employment. And these are just uh, baselines. Of course, we're going to try to exceed. 80% uh, will increase financial literacy before exit. And then 80% will remain permanently housed at the 12 month check in. And of course, all eligible households will also have access to the uh, SOAR application process. Next slide. So as you can see over the five plus years, uh, Impact has served over a thousand households in the four counties. And you can see from the, the follow-up reports that we have that we're over 90% in all categories. Uh, the weird statistic and the only thing I can crunch my uh, brain on why they increase as time goes on is because of the pandemic and the eviction moratorium where a lot, a lot of people really were still housed. They may not have been stable without mm -hmm. that emergency rent assistance, uh, but it's great to hear that our past clients are still still housed right now. Next slide. And a success story. Uh, we had an elderly uh, single uh, female Jane who was in mid 60s, uh, fixed income. Uh, she didn't 
score high enough on the vulnerability assessment to get into PSH. So we got her in rapidly housing and over the two plus years, uh, we really needed a long term plan and that really came with her appealing her VHA voucher. And after many years of appealing, she got it and she moved and now she's on her own and graduated. All right. Thank you, RJ. Very good. Are there any questions from members of the board? This is Amy. I do. Um, I'm wondering Amy. why why uh, is three of the four counties Oregon counties when we're doing this? I'm just wondering. Oh, I just put it as experience. Uh, Impact Northwest started in Multnomah County, and we we grew as an agency. So I just wanted to show our overall experience. Oh, I see. Well, when you search if you're homeless for resources in Clark County, it gives you 13 of like the 15 are for Oregon anyway. So I was just wondering. And and if we have a partner in Oregon willing to cross the river to give resources, we'll do that. Thank you. Thank you, Amy. Any other questions from members of the board? Uh, Karen and then Bridget. Yeah. Hi, this is Karen Kamaroff. I was wondering um, how are uh, domestic violence survivors identified? Um, do they have to come to you with like a, a police report or referral from like an agency like uh, the Y or um, can they be self-referred and just self-identify as a survivor? So uh, all of our referrals do still come through Council for the Homeless. But in general, we, we've had clients who uh, report after we've engaged with them that they're currently fleeing or in a, a domestic violence situation. And we will just work with them uh, based on their self reporting. Thank you. Thank you, Karen. Um, I see Bridget, you have your hand up. Not sure if you're typing a question or if you have your audio now. I'm hopeful you've got audio. Is that right? Yes, I can hear you. Welcome. <laughs> Thanks a lot. I apologize, everybody. Um, I just wondered how many staff you have in uh, Clark County, this side of the river, or whether staff moves back and forth according to needs, or how does that work? So our Clark. Uh... Clark County housing team are in Vancouver. We have shared office space with partners and careers. And currently we have three, but we finally just had someone accept our last open position. So we will be a team of four, uh, but that also doesn't include our supportive service of veteran families, uh, case managers who work in all four counties and will come up occasionally if the veteran is looking for housing in Clark specifically. Thank you. Thank you, RJ. Okay, wonderful. Thank you so much for the great presentation. Uh, we'll go ahead and transition now to our next applicant. We are going to get things, RJ. We're going to welcome Janice Youth Programs. They're also applying for the rapid rehousing category in the amount of two hundred and seven thousand eight hundred and fifty eight dollars. So, who do we have with us today? Oh, hi, this is Dennis Morrow. Uh, I'm the executive director at Janice. Can you hear me? I'm on the phone. Yes, we can see and hear you, Dennis. Welcome. You'll have five minutes. Are you able to see the timer? Well, actually, Scott Conger is uh, was in the meeting, and he is the one that's supposed to be talking. Yeah, hi. Are hi. you there, Scott? Yeah, I'm here. Okay, hi, Scott. Okay. Thank you, Dennis. All right, Scott, yep. you're on. So, hello, everyone. I'm Scott Conger. I'm the program director for Janice's housing programs in Clark County. Um, Today we're going to be asking funding for our NEST program. Um, the NEST program uh, serves youth ages 18 to 25 and getting off the streets and into their own housing. Um, we provide intense case management, uh, which assists with youth. Um, I guess something I should say is a lot of the youth that we work with don't trust adults initially. So a lot of the work that we do is developing relationships with those youth. This is what this slide is for. Um, we were going to touch on this slide at the end, but I guess we don't have any other slides, so we'll go with it right now. Um, the youth, the way we work with the youth is we have a outreach program and a drop in center. And then we have a new numerous housing programs, but what happens is our outreach program connects with youth in the community that are living in the streets or places not meant for habitability. And, uh, develops relationship and a lot of the youth, as I said, that we work with have a great just distrust towards adults as. 
the system has wronged them over the years. So what we do is develop a relationship and Janice is known throughout the community as uh, being a trusted organization for youth. So the youth initially build trust that with contacts with our outreach program, and then they come into the drop in center. <clears throat> and that helps us to create that correct connection and trust. And then we refer them to the council for the homeless where they get assessed and then they get put into one of our various housing programs. Um, we have a variety of housing programs, whether it be a motel voucher program to prevention programs to cables terrace apartment program. Um, but this is the nest housing program and this is <clears throat> this along with our TBA funds TBRA funds are the only programs in the com community that specifically address youth to help them off the streets and into housing. Um, we have about a 90% success rate of youth obtaining housing and maintaining housing once they're in the program and become self-sufficient. Um, our case managers work throughout the programs, different programs to assist the youth. So they have, as RJ pointed out, uh, developed skills of PSH participants, but can tailor those skills to rapid rehousing programs. Uh, we work with a number of youth families too. So it's not just youth that are on the street, but about 40% of the youth that we work with uh, actually have kids. So the program is designed to help assist the youth as well as their families. Um, we work with about a 40% minority population that we serve in community and we target specific minority organizations to help assist with referrals to make sure that we are reaching different minority populations throughout the community. Um, one of the things I'll say is that, uh, you know, we, we started this program because we were watching youth come through the, through the nest, or I'm sorry, come through the drop-in center and then not have services and graduate into the adult population, even though we've already developed that trust. So we started with this program to assist youth um, to get them off the streets and housed before they graduated into the adult population. We like to be the last program that youth ever need and uh, get them out of the system. And again, we have a 90% success rate of youth leaving the system and not coming back. So we like to, we didn't want to see them graduate into the adult population. So we like to say that we're the last service that youth will ever need. And that is holds true most of the time. Uh, I'll end with like a quick success story here. Um, recently, we had a youth named Bella. I mean, it's a, not a real name. Um, she came to us, she was a DV survivor. She was at the age of 22, had three kids, um, and they were living out of her car. We were able to get her, with the help of our housing navigator, get her housed within two days um, and help her obtain employment uh, at a chiropractic clinic. And she uh, actually just enrolled in school at Clark College. Um, and all three of her youth, or all three of her kids are now in school or daycare. And she'll be off the program within a matter of months. So. That's ideally how we'd like to see the process work. Um, sometimes it can take up to six months, 12 months, but ideally like to see six, three to six months. Um, Dennis, do you have anything to add real quick before we run out of time? I'd just say, if you look at the hourglass, we call it that's on the slide. When Scott says we divert them from adult homelessness, at the bottom it shows you what the community return on investment is, which is pre-COVID, it's 2.1 million. For boys and 2.7 million for girls. That's how much we as a community save when these youth don't age into that adult homelessness, the services they will need. And that would be much higher now post COVID given the uh, stress and what's happened to youth and people homeless on the street. Thank you very much, both of you. Okay, we're going to open it up for board questions. I see Rob has his hand up. Hi, thank you. Um, I think you just answered this, but maybe it bears repeating. How long does it? usually take or on average take uh, from the beginning of outreach uh, until the youth and their family have housing? So it, to go from the beginning of outreach is a little difficult because it varies between person to person and how quickly they're willing to, to trust adults. Um, sometimes outreach to get them into the perch can take years. Sometimes it can take a matter of days. So, um, but once we get them into the housing program, and get them housed. We can normally house someone within the, the first couple of weeks. We, we always shoot for the first week, but sometimes they have a lot of barriers. And I should say this, Rob, the referrals that we're getting from the Council for the Homeless use a vulnerability assessment tool. Um, so the higher the vulnerability, the more likely they are to get into the, to the program and we're raising that vulnerability level. So 
once they're in the program and they're housed, we can only get them housed, like I said, within a couple of weeks. And then to get them self-sufficient, usually it used to take about three to six months, maybe a year. Now we're looking sometimes 18 to 24 months um, and working with them longer even after that. Just because the the barriers that they come with us and the vulnerability, the longer you're on the street, the more trauma you develop, and the longer it takes to acclimate to to get back to society. I believe it. So, days to years is what it sounds like. Yeah, it can be. Yeah. It's yeah. It varies quite. Yeah, a bit. Rob, I, if I could just say, uh, when I talk to groups about, I say, let's not talk about homeless youth in our community. Let's talk about familyless children. Because I don't have a single person that, that comes to our organization or Scott's programs that woke up at 13 years old and said, I want to go sleep in the, in the street tonight. So when we say it takes sometimes months to years for those outreach workers to build trust, uh, these are kids who have been abandoned oftentimes by their families, sometimes have been in social services unsuccessfully, uh, oftentimes have trauma, uh, uh, mental health and other uh, DV types of issues. So they don't trust adults because adults did it to them. But the outreach workers, we just they just keep going back. They take supplies. They go to where they are and make that relationship. And sometimes they can take them in that day with them, and sometimes it'll be a couple of years. But once once they once they make the connection, we don't give up on them. And they well, our motto is once a Janus kid, always a Janus kid. So they also know, hey, if they're out there and uh, get lost and something happens, they can always come back. The door is always open to get them into these because we've got to get them in those housing programs to get them off the street, and that's our goal. Thank you, Rob. Did that answer your question? We have two more questions. It did. I wondered if they had a connection to school districts and their housing um, or their homeless services. Yeah, we, we do, Rob. We, we work with the homeless liaisons. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, and the outreach workers are very closely connected with them also. So, yeah. Thank you for that question, Rob. Um, we're going to go to Jamie and then Bridget. Um, it's a two kind of short questions. Do you have a sense for how many youth you are serving in outreach at the moment? Yeah. Hey, Jamie, how are you doing? Um, I don't have those numbers. Heather Wilkins runs the outreach program. Um, Dennis, do you have any idea? Uh, I don't have the current numbers. During COVID, the numbers have gone down. Uh, uh, the outreach workers are still going out, but we've seen this across. Uh, we work in Portland also, and we've seen the same thing that the youth have really uh, kind of they're holding and staying back because of the COVID and everything that's gone on, the violence and mental health issues on the street and everything else. Uh, so we're seeing fewer youth, but we're having more contacts with them and continuing to encourage them. And uh, and. One of the major referrals that we have into the program is actually from other youth on the street that they'll come in and say, I was with somebody and they said you helped. And so just being out there, we keep, we didn't quit going out just because of the COVID stuff, but we had to restrict some of the visits and originally, and then, you know, masking and all of this kind of stuff has been a problem, but uh, we're still out there and still working. So I would say, I don't have the exact number, but it's fewer. Uh, usually what we would see is we might say, uh, say a thousand or two thousand contacts in a year, but that might be with six or eight hundred youth because you're having multiple contacts again with those youth to get them in. So um, typically that would be the kind of volume we'd look at. Thank you, Dennis. And, and to the board members, I'm trying to be very sensitive to time because we have multiple presentations today. So Jamie and all board members, can we make sure our questions are specific to the grant application? That would help us stay on course here. Jamie, you said you had a second question. It was about uh, housing retention. You mentioned how much you know we save by youth not having to enter into adult homelessness. So I was just curious about if you have that data. Yeah. So over the over the first six months, we have about a ninety percent success rate, and over the, the next two years, we have an eighty five percent success rate of people that are in the program maintaining self sufficiency. So, and those ones that that may falter. We, like Jan Dennis said, we're once a Janus youth, always a Janus youth. So in let, uh, instead of letting them go back into homelessness, we'll assist them in re rehousing them or finding an alternative to housing. Did that answer your question, Jamie? We'll assume it did. Thank you so much. And uh, we'll go ahead and move over to Bridget. Bridget, I saw your hand go down. In the interest of time, I I won't ask my question, <laughs> so you can move along. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, 
Well, Alicia, I didn't know at the second part of Jamie's question. I couldn't tell if she was saying where did where did those numbers come from about the savings. Uh, so Scott talked about retention in housing, but what we did is we looked at what would be an average or a typical usage of a youth who was highly traumatized on the streets moving into adult homelessness. And then you look at the cost of residential care for them, uh, mental health costs. Uh, in some cases with boys, it's higher because of incarceration costs. And then with the, with the young women, it was higher because of the, uh, the, their numbers are totally higher because of cost of their children in child welfare, mental uh, health, and all those types of things. So we just looked at average numbers and an average length of time conservative. Those are conservative numbers that, uh, uh, that we would have to spend uh, on that family if they didn't get housed. So that's where that came from. Thank you for that clarification. Okay, thank you so much, Scott, for your presentation and for joining us, Dennis. Um, up next is going to be Lifeline, also applying for rapid rehousing funds. Their request is for $100,000. Lifeline, welcome. Thank you. Uh, I'm Joe Foster. I'm the interim CEO for Lifeline Connections, and our main presenter today will be uh, Mark Holan. Mark, will you introduce yourself and jump into our presentation? Yes, my name is Mark Holan. I'm one of the housing specialists here at Lifeline Connections. Thank you for letting us speak with you today. Lifeline Connections has been providing treatment for people with behavior health disorders since 1962. Many of our folks have long-term substance use disorders, many have serious mental illness, and many have both. Recovery isn't easy, and when you're homeless, it's even tougher. More than 90% of our patients are low income or very low income. Many have been or are homeless. As we'll discuss, safe housing is absolutely essential to achieving a successful recovery. Next slide, please. Our request is for 100,000 per year to support 10 to 12 households per year for the two year contract period. We're requesting roughly $65,000 for direct rent assistance, 25,000 for our housing case manager and 10,000 for administrative costs. Since the pandemic began, housing clients have required more assistance and for longer periods. We are requesting these amounts due to rising housing costs and increased client needs. Assistance generally ranges from six months to two years. Next slide, please. People with behavior health disorders often experience unique barriers to housing. Without stable housing, it is difficult for individuals to work toward their self-sufficiency and recovery goals. And the need is growing as we experience this pandemic. Most important, providing community-based services and supports like housing strengthen individuals' abilities to improve their situation. In addition to our treatment program, Lifeline Connection offers recovery support services that include supportive housing, supportive employment, recovery resource center, transportation services, and an outreach and engagement specialist to facilitate engagement in our treatment programs. This will be extremely helpful for those who are needing to re-engage in their SUD or mental health counseling. Next slide, please. RRH will serve 10 to 12 homeless households per year with 85% exiting to permanent housing. We will provide all three components of a low barrier rapid rehousing model using a trauma informed approach. One, housing identification. Our case managers will actively engage with finding and obtaining housing in partnership with the client. Two, rent and move in assistance. These funds provide direct support for security and utility deposits and rent and utility assistance. Three, housing case management and services, which are always client directed and voluntary and support additional needs such as income stabilization and ongoing housing management intervention and support. Next slide, please. Our success story, thanks to rapid rehousing, our client was able to obtain full-time employment and independently pay for her monthly finances. 
housing case management services connected her to resume building and competitive paying jobs. At her last month of assistance, she was in a great and stable place with a long-term goal of buying a house. She mentioned being very grateful for the year of assistance that she received. Last slide. Thank you for your time. We're happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you very much. Hey, board, do you have questions? Looking across for hands. We do have time for questions. We have five minutes. Go ahead, Bridget. So I, I wondered how this links into Lifeline substance abuse recovery and addiction services. Like, are they a different set of clients? Is there easy transparency between the transfer between the programs? Is it automatically if they're one or in the other, or are they separate sections of lifeline? Thanks for the question, Bridget. It's it's a mix of what you just the options you kind of just laid out. Often it's individuals that we're already serving. Maybe if they're visiting our sobering center or they've been through our detox center, and we identify pretty quickly that a leading factor in them uh, being able to sustain recovery is going to be safe and stable housing. So we coordinate with our, you know, we place an active referral between our departments here at Lifeline. You know, Mark Colin is one of our house, you know, who presented with us. Mark is one of our housing uh, coordinators. He works with individuals actively in our inpatient programs to make sure they have a safe and stable place to to go once they've left our inpatient program. So that's that's one way people come to us. Um, also, we work with Council for the Homeless and for individuals who have an, a substance use disorder where their their key driver is that's contributing to their homelessness. Uh, Council for the Homeless uh, prioritizes those folks to Lifeline so that because we have the expertise on the treatment side as well as getting them into stable housing. Can I ask a, a follow up then? At what point is there a distinction between Medicare funding for um, services and the county sort of grant like this one? Like Medicare is picking up more of those support services funding these days. So how do you transfer between the two? Yeah, so Med Medicaid will cover the treatment services <laughs> and Medicaid will cover some supportive housing um, services. So in our application, when we identify matching funds, we identify that Medicaid through foundational community supports, the FSC contract with Medicaid um, can cover um, roughly 35% of our expected staff costs. And that's where we still have some staff costs in our requests for funding like RRA. So it's a blended funding model, leveraging the state and federal funds that are available, and then matching, having county or local money fill the fill the gaps. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I, I have a, a clarifying question. In the first or second slide, you outlined your request, and it said a hundred thousand per year. Um, that would make it a two hundred thousand dollar request, if I'm not mistaken. But on our agenda, it has it listed as a total of 100,000. Uh, Jeff Zawad is on as well, our fund development director. Jeff, can you clarify? Or maybe yes. Rebecca? Yeah, but I do apologize. The, the, the request is actually for 200,000 over the two year period. We listed it as $100,000 per year. Okay, so maybe uh, Rebecca, if that's- Alicia, hey, Alicia, yes. it's Beth, just to clarify. So when we, um, in the RFA process, we ask agencies to submit their annual budget and then um, and then we budget based on an annual um, basis from known grants, house bill collections, other other revenue sources. So we are looking at annual totals and those okay. contracts would run for two years with the possibility of a third year extension. Okay, perfect. Thank you. That, that wasn't clear on the agenda Thank itself. You. Okay, Thank wonderful. You. Any any other questions for Lifeline? Hearing none, thank you so much for, for coming to present and for your application. We'll go ahead and move on to our next item on the agenda, which is share. This is a request for rapid rehousing in the amount of $290,000. Welcome back, Katie. You got five minutes. 
<laughs> like we're gonna be best of friends by the time this day is over. Um, so I'm actually really excited. This is my favorite funding source. Um, this is our county rapid rehousing um, funding source, and we are asking for 260,000 to continue serving um, some of the most vulnerable in our community. Um, I love this funding source because of its flexibility um, and the the unique need that it serves for our community specifically. Um, right now, we are currently supporting five households um, have the capacity to request and take on 10 more. Um, so that would be a total of 15. I think our outcomes um, expected are to reach 18 households, which we have done so far. Um, we have transitioned nine of those rapid rehousing um, households off onto an emergency housing voucher, which supports them for an additional 10 years. Um, we are also providing extended support services if a client needs our support in helping negotiate um, you know, with a landlord or any, any other supports. We're continuing to support those clients as well. Um, we have 100% retention and also um, positive exit rate right now. Um, and the very specific need that this funding source um, meets is that we too, I know that Scott and the other providers have um, mentioned this, but we are vulnerability based. All of our referrals come from the Council for the Homeless. There is a vulnerability assessment completed on these clients. And the clients that we are seeing are very highly vulnerable. Um, could probably score into permanent supportive housing. Yet, you know, we try to get, because there's a limited capacity for our permanent supportive housing, we of course want to um, provide another funding source um, and program to be able to support these clients. So we are seeing, um, you know, people with very significant uh, long-term behavioral health um, medical needs. Um, our population that we're serving continuously is getting, you know, older, um, and that comes with other unique um, uh, needs. Um, and just overall more uh, needing more supports. Um, so we are able to look at most rapid rehousing, rapid rehousing funding sources will only provide uh, rental assistance and case management services for up to 24 months. Uh, Pre-pandemic, we were hoping to get people through rapid rehousing uh, programs in, you know, a three to six months, and then they transition off and we could serve more people. Post-pandemic and this, not post, we are not post, um, still <laughs> pandemic, and also um, with this funding source specifically, we are seeing people needing supports for longer amounts of time um, at a higher level. So um, we we prioritize people that are, are extremely highly vulnerable that are referred to us for rapid rehousing to this program um, because this program does not have a time limit on it. So we can support people um, until we help them successfully um, stabilize and can transition off of the program um, uh, onto either, you know, supporting them, you know, being able to support their own um, costs of living, or we find another program that helps them be able to retain that permanent housing that they found. Um, so we definitely, and, and this need is so great to be able to do that. So um, that's why I absolutely love this funding source. Um, I'd say three of the nine that we transitioned off onto that emergency housing voucher had been on our program for uh, over uh, up to three years. Um, and it's just that their particular needs were very, very significant. And it took time to be able to um, assist with getting people uh, social security, disability. I'm sure a lot of you can I uh, understand that that process can take two or three denials to be able to get them their social security. Um, once they got their social security, that wasn't uh, enough to sustain rents in this area. Um, and so it was really exciting to be able to support them long enough to be able to help them successfully transition um, off, off of our program and to something that's going to provide them with that rental assistance they need for up to 10 years. So. Um, this rapid rehousing program is the 
is is imperative for our community to be able to help support some of the most vulnerable that do not qualify for PSH, um, but definitely could use that support level. Thank you, Katie. Very, very good. Questions from board members? We do have five minutes for questions. Feel free to unmute yourself. Bridget, go ahead. Uh, yeah, uh, maybe this is a general question. It, it, uh, the housing vulnerability assessment, that ranks um, people who are completing it in terms of need. So PSH is the highest need and the rapid rehousing is lo a lower level of need than PSH. But you said this was meeting the needs of the most needy in the community. So I'm wondering what the distinction is. Should these people be in PSH if there was space or is, is the less need for these people than there is in PSH? Does that make sense? I just makes, don't know the reason, I think. No, Bridget, that makes absolute sense. And I think Council for the Homeless would be better at answering kind of the the some of those like the logistics. But what I can say is that we have a gap in need. So yes, uh, our highest vulnerability, uh, our high, most highly vulnerable in the community, and this is all off self-report too, which comes with some of its own issues, right? Somebody self-reporting their vulnerability and who they're reporting it to. But um, we have those people that score really high on the vulnerability assessment tool, which go into our PSH. Um, we also have people that score pretty high, but not high enough. And so we're going to give them the next or try to still support them, right, with the next level of, of support. With a, It might be a little bit lighter touch. It, it might be a rapid rehousing program. Um, but yes, if there was more PSH spots, a lot more of these rapid rehousing clients probably would go in there. And I know Scott said there, uh, he had mentioned that they are raising vulnerability for rapid rehousing too, which is kind of what we're all experiencing. Um, just that there's more rapid rehousing available, but this program specifically does not have a time limit. Um, I also support these clients um, instead of a ratio of one to 25 for normal rapid rehousing, we do one to 20 just to make up, to make sure that we're able to support the high needs of the clients. Um, but yes, this is, this is that one program that kind of bridges that gap that we have in that vulnerability scoring um, tool that we use. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we have Karen and then Jamie. Go ahead, Karen. Yeah, hi. I was just curious. Um, it, you you talked about the um, the lengthy process for the SSI applications, but are you not using the SOAR? um process oh yeah they, that's a good question yes we do use the SOAR process we also uh have clients that come to us that are working with a um an attorney already or they're doing other things and like to take you know we support them in whatever path they've chosen to achieve that social security goal but yes we definitely try to prioritize the SOAR program okay thank you and process Go ahead, Jamie. Um, thank you. Uh, if there is no time limit on this program, is there any, is there really any difference between this and a PSH program? Is there any difference in level of service or anything like that? Absolutely not, because we're trying to support. I mean, the only difference is that the caseload is a little bit higher, but across the board, we've adopted um, all of the same best practices that you would use with permanent supportive housing, um, just because we see the increasing need in our rapid rehousing as well. So, um, no, we want to support them the same exact way we would support everybody across the board. Thank you. Did that answer your question, Jamie? I'm gonna I'm gonna assume yes. I see that Beth has her hand raised. Thank you, Alicia. Um, just a couple clarification points as well um, for the board. Um, the main difference between PSH and rapid rehousing is going to be some income income qualification items yeah. on there. That's uh, but generally speaking, as far as vulnerability. 
populations who are most vulnerable in our community are intended to be served first. And that's a, a general approach to achieve functional zero. Um, just FYI for a board. Uh, and then Katie, I also wanted to ask if you could speak a little bit around how uh, mental health and behavioral health services are integrated. I know we're short on time, so just real quick how you partner with those entities and provide that service. Absolutely. Uh, thank you for pointing out uh, the, the income level <laughs> difference. Um, so we, we partner um, and work very closely with uh, Community Services Northwest, with Lifeline, with Comet teams. Um, we also uh, collaborate for meeting people's medical needs with CDM. Um, they're an in-home care service. Uh, and then also with, obviously, with DSHS uh, to be able to get all of those needs met. But um, behavioral health is, is a priority um, for all of us. And that means uh, that we have to work really closely with our partner agencies uh, to be able to do those wraparound services. We're good at housing helping stabilize in housing. We are not the mental health or behavioral health experts. So we definitely rely on those partners um, in our community to be able to meet us, you know, meet our clients where they're at and be able to meet that need. Thank you, Katie. And thank you for those clarifying questions, Beth. Okay, we'll go ahead and close this presentation. Thanks for joining us this morning, Katie, and we'll welcome Council for the Homeless. They are applying for targeted prevention funds and they are our second to last presenter today. Is there someone here from Council for the Homeless? Hi, Alicia, it's Beth. Hey. I believe Sunny is here. I, I see Sunny. I'm not sure if she's having mic issues or. Can you hear me now? Yes. yes. Hello, hey. welcome. Go ahead, you have the floor. Awesome. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Thanks for having me. Uh, my name is Sunny Wonder, and uh, we are here. I'm here to talk about prevention is diversion. And the ask, just to tell you a little bit about the ask. Um, next slide, please. We are requesting $150,000. Um, with this funding, we'll be providing one-time rental assistance. So this is for folks who are at imminent risk of eviction, which most definitely over the past two years, this need has shifted pretty dramatically in our community. But the focus is still on lightest touch with this approach and giving assistance to prevent evictions, as well as for folks who are um, perhaps uh, in need of moving costs, we know that moving costs have gotten much, much higher over the past couple of years in particular as housing costs have gone up. So folks often don't have, you know, up to, I've seen four to $5,000 costs in needing assistance to move in, but they wouldn't qualify for um, move in um, assistance through and it because they aren't literally homeless. So maybe there's couching, staying with friends or family. So that is the focus as well as some staffing uh, to operate the program. The access points are through the housing hotline and our online portal, um, which has been a big shift just to increase accessibility for folks um, through the online portal, or portal as well. Next slide. So what is prevention as diversion? So as I mentioned, it's really about the lightest touch and offering supports for folks who are needing just that financial assistance and really brief but intensive engagement to get them stabilized in their housing situation. We're, we're focusing in on barrier reduction. An example of that could be helping someone write a reasonable accommodation. Perhaps they had an eviction and are needing support in writing a reasonable accommodation to explain the situation. Um, another piece is connection to community resources. The goal, because we're providing one-time assistance, we wanna make sure that folks are aware of as many resources as possible so they're able to solve the situation moving forward. They feel more stable and able to address um, any unexpected costs moving forward. Uh, one-time flexible financial assistance, as I mentioned, it's often moving cost assistance, um, barrier reduction assistance. We really want to focus in on the needs of the folks that we're seeing and addressing the needs that they're bringing up. So that could be a lot of different pieces, but we definitely see a lot of need for fees, 
for example, when someone is getting moved in, application fees, stuff like that, that can be a really heavy burden for folks. Next slide. So the benefits of the, this approach um, is really about being client-centered and empowering. We really want to dig in because it is very brief. Um, we want to dig in and be as creative as possible. And when the household is leading the conversation, the creativity most definitely springs up. We see a lot more of engagement and folks feeling empowered to bring up potential solutions that we I wouldn't have thought of myself. Um, it is most definitely very fast paced, um, most definitely uh, as evictions have started, the staff, there's a big burden to um, move as quickly as possible. Sometimes someone has an eviction notice, we're working very closely with partners to make sure that we can prevent that eviction. Um, mm -hmm. Addressing barriers, so really about reducing those barriers, giving them the tools that they need to be able to reduce those barriers moving forward. Um, enhancing supports, the idea is we know housing, but wanting to get folks really connected and wrapped around by the community, which means more knowledge, greater knowledge of the resources available to them in the community. Cost efficient, um, when we are preventing someone who is in a housing, in a couching situation, staying with friends or family from slipping into homelessness, as well as preventing eviction from happening, the burden on our larger system is much less. So it is most definitely advantageous um, to prevent those evictions from occurring. Um, also building system capacity, again, thinking of that cost efficiency, getting folks the support that they um, need before they're slipping into homelessness means the more vulnerable folks are able to be connected to other resources. As well as a high diversity of participants, we definitely see a lot of different folks that are seeking these resources. Okay, thank you so much, Sunny. Um, I do see a couple questions in the chat. Um, I will just remind folks um, on the board to tailor your questions to the specific grant proposal. Um, but Amy did have a question about screening uh how do you ensure the people who are applying uh truly qualify for the funds yeah that's a good question and definitely something that is of concern for a lot of folks recognizing there's a lot of funding that recently has come into the community with treasury um the treasury assistance we um have pretty significant very um burden on paperwork um where we're looking at for example we have a wonderful database um it's called gis we're able to check um who the owner is and make sure that we're making appropriate payments it's very very important to us that we adhere to the guidelines that are set and that our staff are aware of all the tools available to them um, and really engaging with the household and making sure that we're gathering all of the necessary paperwork so there are most definitely a lot of people in place with the paperwork that we collect with the questions that we're asking um, most definitely if anything is hey, this seems a little bit weird we're asking further questions making sure that we're understanding the situation I will say that we um, while there may be situations where folks have taken advantage of the system by and far the folks that we've seen um, you know it can be a burden to gather the necessary documentation and frustrating for folks, which we definitely understand. We try to reduce that, but we also, of course, want to find that good balance of making sure that we're doing our due diligence to get the information and making sure it's getting to folks that need it. Thank you. Um, Bridget, go ahead. Uh, yes, I wondered uh, how many people you said uh, you observed and what the average amount of dollar amount of support. Has, has worked out yeah, that's a really good question. Um, so I will say that if you had talked to me two years ago, I would have a great number for you and it'd be really on point. Um, I think that the average was about $1,200 um, and serving about 40 households. If you think of you know matching funds and all of that, it's definitely a higher number. What we have seen over the past year, and you've probably heard in other presentations, is that things have changed very dramatically. So we're seeing folks with just a higher level of need in that, you know, because of losing their job and then, you know, 
having to quarantine at home right after getting a new job for a lot of different reasons. The cost is actually, we're seeing a significant number of folks who owe, for example, six months of rental assistance, meaning six months, as well as I noted that moving costs have significantly ballooned. So perhaps someone needed 2,000, now they need 4,000. I am still estimating roughly, um, I believe that the number I put in there was about 38 households. Um, and also making sure that we are um, tying in other privately fundraised dollars and um, making sure that we're being very, very thoughtful and stretching as far as possible to assist households. But it, it definitely has changed pretty dramatically over the past two years on the needs that we're seeing. So with the funds coming up, you figure you would serve at least, say, 40 households of maybe 4,000 people? Is that what you're saying based on past practice? Yes, I believe that that was the number that we had um, had put into the um, the ask, and that's the number that's coming to mind. To mind. I apologize for not remembering the exact number. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Bridget. Any other questions from members of the board? Okay, hey, hearing none, thank you so much, Sunny, for coming and presenting and for your application. Uh, we'll go ahead and transition now to our final presentation for today. We're welcoming back Janice Youth Programs and their application under the targeted prevention. Uh, the amount of this request annually looks like 170930 Hello everyone, it's Scott Conger again. See y'all again. Um, last one, so hang in there, you're almost there. So the funds that we're here um, are for targeted prevention. And uh, the reason that we request targeted prevention in a lot of adult populations don't is because of the HUD, which is housing and urban development definition of what is homelessness. And to be homeless, you have to be either living on a place, living in the streets, in a place not meant for habitability or a couple other things. Um, to be housed and need prevention, you either need to be on a lease or you need to be couch surfing. And that couch surfing is the important piece here with youth. So couch surfing means you're staying at friend's house and bouncing around. And a lot of, so HUD says that you're housed if you're couch surfing. Where a lot of youth ages 18 to 25, you know, may get kicked out of their home and their friend's mom, <laughs> might let them stay there. So they bounce from house to house to house. And HUD kind of puts this all in one category for adults and youth and says that they're, they are housed. When we all know that youth that bounce from house to house to house and some nights stay outside um, are not housed. So this program helps them before they literally become street entrenched to house them before they end up on the streets and develop all the trauma that streets um, people develop when they're on the streets. So um, the way this works is if somebody, there's a lot of money that's coming into the community right now for housing prevention or for homeless prevention, I'm sorry, um, through the treasury rental assistance program, but th that doesn't offer help for youth that are couch surfing. So this is the only program in the community that offers assistance for youth that are couch surfing to help them become housed and stably housed before they hit the streets and become street entrenched youth. Um, we work with this program just like we do with other programs. We do intense case management, developing trust with them, connecting them to other services in the community, to help them get employment, schooling, anything to help them become stably housed. Um, this program is a much shorter time span. We try, generally try to work with people for three to six months, and our success rate in this program is over 90% of people becoming self sufficient within six months. Um, and that, again, keeps them out of the adult homeless population. So, I don't know, Dennis, do you have anything else to say? I don't want to go too long if we don't need to. Yeah, I think uh, we, you, you mentioned before on the other program, but we have the same uh, same uh, benefit here, which is many of these youth often may have kids of their own, right? It's possible. And also we have a very high representation of minority youth into the program, which I think shows the community need, but also when people say, do the, do the kids trust you? I think we would not have an over-representation of minority youth in Clark County if we didn't have the real trust of the youth in those populations. But I think those are accurate, Scott? Yeah, definitely, definitely. And again, this slide does pertain to this because a lot of the youth that we do serve uh, meet our outreach program on the streets. Um, 
even though they are couch surfing, they, you know, they're, if they're staying with a friend's mom, they're not going to stay at the house when they go, when the mom goes to work during the day. So couch surfing can, it's, it's just almost just like homelessness. Um, in a lot of cases, you know, you go to somebody's house and it's, <clears throat> they, you get there and the dad might be working great, or if they're night shift. And if you're sleeping on the couch, you don't, you really, or you're sleeping in the hallway, you may be able to sleep, you know, sometime between two in the morning till six in the morning when somebody gets up and then you have to leave the house again. So for youth, it really is much closer to homelessness than it is for adults that are living with a friend. So, um, and this is, again, the only service in the community to help these youth. So we really appreciate you uh, providing this service to the youth of Clark County. It's really imperative to, to help them before the population of homelessness on the streets actually booms. So, and we, uh, I know there's a question about outreach and how many youth we see. We think that uh, because of the pandemic, this population has actually grown and a lot more youth are staying with friends, parents and stuff and parents aren't letting them hit the streets necessarily. Um, and they're providing options. So we see this number just going way up. We don't, we don't even keep track of it at the council because they just open it. They take the calls when there's opening. So we don't even actually know how many youth are couch surfing in the community, but we suspect right now it's incredibly high. Okay, are you okay. building your time back for questions? Yeah, yeah, we don't no. want to keep you any longer than you have to. Okay, well, thank you, Scott. I do see Bridget has her hand up. Bridget. It's always me. Um, I just wondered, you have the Yellow Brook Road and you have the Mets and you have outreach programs. Do you blend all those services? How do you, how do you make a distinction between outcomes from one to another or does it matter? Well, that's a great question, Bridget. A lot of the different programs, uh, the way we decide who's in what's program is where they are when they come to the service. So the difference between, let's say, the Nest and Bridges the nest to qualify for the nest youth to have to be homeless on the streets, living in a place not meant for habitability or in a hotel paid for by a different program. Um, but where this program, you have to be either couch surfing or at eminent risk of becoming homelessness. So the services that we provide as they come to the program are very similar, help them become self-sufficient, help them develop life skills, um, gain employment, uh, get GEDs and college diplomas. Um, so the services once they're in the program are very similar um, for prevention and rapid rehousing and even Cables Terrace. But when they come to us, it's it's where they came from initially that determines which program they land in. But I think I think she was also asking about the uh, I think she was also Bridget. You're also asking about the integration of services, and they're all totally integrated. So the outreach workers, their home base is that that Yellow Brick Road is our uh, outreach program. Their home base is the Perch, which is our drop-in center in downtown Vancouver. So if outreach workers can encourage youth into the Perch and then the Perch, we have case managers who can then begin to get them into the program Scott is talking about. On the other hand, if they come to the Perch first, that doesn't, Yellow Brick Road just is, is aware of them, but they won't be involved uh, or youth can just get to come directly to the program. But all of these programs are interconnected. Scott is a leadership for all of the housing, and then we have another leader for the uh, the perch and the outreach and an emergency shelter for younger kids that we have. But they're all highly integrated. So the idea is the youth gets to the service they need once they're within Janus. They get to the service they need, and outcomes show that that works. I I can see that makes sense. So they don't leave one program to go into the next program to go into the next program as no. services become available. Okay. No, they, they go, yeah, they, they, they walk in the door and wherever they are, they're in the door and then our job is to find a place to fit for them and that's what we do. And if they come in the wrong door, we get them to the right door. So that's, yeah. Thank you. Thank, yep. you, Bridget. Thank you. Any other questions from members of the board? Okay, seeing no hands and hearing, oh, there's one. Uh, Beth, please go ahead. Thanks, Alicia. I'm just trying to make sure I'm not um, moving space for board members. Um, Scott, can you talk a little bit about your staff to client ratios, the uh, training and expertise that staff have to serve clients? And if that does not include behavioral health and mental health backgrounds, can you talk a bit about how you integrate those services? Yeah, thanks, Beth. Um, so everybody, at Janice is extensively trained in working with youth. 
um, that's trauma informed, positive youth development, uh, motivational interview, array of best practices um, that we all staff are trained in. Um, and then staff, we've had staff, our staff retention is really great. Most of our staff have been, mm -hmm. for, a lot of them have been here for over five years, but everybody on our team has been here for over a couple, two years at least, um, because it's a really great program to work for. So they, it's really, some people stick around, but that also allows us to continue training, mm -hmm. monthly trainings, and then uh, have trainings available frequently. Um, so for behavioral health, and mental health services, we work with Columbia River as well as CSNW, Community Services Northwest. And we actually have a really relationship developed with Community Services Northwest that we have um, for youth of higher needs that are struggling to obtain uh, behavioral services. We have a referral process that they'll come out to us and assist in uh, meeting with the youth where they're at. Um, again, this goes back to the youth not necessarily trusting adult organizations. So a lot of the youth won't go to obtain behavioral health services. So you develop a specific relationship with CSNW that they, you know, will do the warm handoff and they'll come meet us uh, at the youth's house or out in the field, wherever the youth may want to meet. So uh, having those services is crucial to the success of this program, um, addressing behavioral health needs uh, after somebody is off the streets or living through traumatic experiences is, is always paramount to their long-term success. So those relationships are really um, something that we, we lean on for the success of all of our programs. Thank you, Scott. Yeah. Uh, I guess I would also just add that, that uh, when he says that's essential uh, during COVID, it's always been essential, but it is now crucial to have those link to those mental health systems for the kids. We have had the highest number of uh, youth suicides in Portland, in our Portland, uh, we have four different agencies that work with homeless youth in Portland, and we've had the highest number of youth suicides on the street in the past year that we have ever had. Uh, so the same thing he's talking about, we have to have availability, almost instant availability of those behavioral health services. And it's wonderful that here, they don't have to go to the office, the office will come to them and that's, that's crucial for this population. Okay, um, thank you so much for that. Very last uh, question or comment, just being sensitive to time. Amy, go ahead. Um, I may have missed it. Uh, do you guys work with the resource coordinators at the schools, at the public schools? I'm just wondering. You, yes, we work with the homeless liaisons. Okay, thank you. If you work with some resource coordinators, the thing is a lot of, we currently only have one youth that is in high school. A lot of the youth that we work with are 18 to, to 25, 24. Um, so if somebody's in high school, then we will work with the resource coordinators, but we work with homeless liaisons to, to identify the need, but the resource coordinators we work with currently, there's only one that we have that's finishing up her senior year. So you're, you're saying that there's only one under 18 that you're working with right now. Is that what you're saying? She's over 18. So, so we, this, uh, this program as well Sorry. as the nest, we put people into their own, own homes, into their own apartments. So they have to be 18 to be able to sign that lease. <laughs> So, um, currently we only have 1 18 year old that is still in high school. So, if, if somebody's still in high school, then we do wraparound services with the high school. As well as any other, we, all of our programs, we do a lot of wraparound services, which is where you connect all the supports that they have, whether that be DCYF or DSHS or schooling or employment. And we all come to the table together to help support, create a support network to help the youth. And that helps them when they're in the program as well as when they exit the program to have a support network around them. Um, so if somebody is in high school, then we work with the, the, them closely to make sure that the person can finish high school. I hope that answers your question. Thanks, Amy. Okay, All right. Thank you, Amy. thank you, Scott. Thank you so much, Dennis, for coming. That concludes our presentations for today. Uh, I believe we will have a round two, but this is. Um, Really good process. Thank you, Rebecca. I've, I've really enjoyed all the presentations and have learned a lot and have become better informed as an applicant scorer. Um, with that, we do have on our agenda an opportunity for the public to come forward and make comments. So this is the portion of the agenda. We will open the floor to public comments. Is there anyone on the phone or in this meeting who wishes to speak? Is there anyone here wishing to speak? 
Okay, hearing none and seeing no hands raised, I'll go ahead and close the open forum for public comment. Um, I will remind board members that our next meeting is on April 6th from 9 a.m. to 11 a.m. via WebEx. I would also like to welcome um, our newest member, Kim Harless, who has joined us, Vancouver City Council member Harless. Uh, welcome to the cab. Um, we do have one minute remaining, and I wanted to ask if you wanted to make any any comments or to introduce yourself if you're still on the line. Yeah, absolutely. Um, can you hear me? Yes. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah. Um, thank you so much for the welcome. Um, these are fantastic presentations. What a meeting to for my first meeting. Um, what a great one to be the first. <laughs> um, but yeah, I'm really excited to be here and be a. Um, on this board and excited to get to know. I know many of you already, but it's exciting to work with you on this and get to know each other even more. Thank you, and the feeling is mutual. All right, is there anything for the good of the order before I adjourn? It's 11 o'clock on the hour. I wanna be responsible uh, for your time. Hearing none, thank you all so much for your time this morning and I look forward to seeing you all again on April 6th, if not before. Meetings adjourned. Thank you.